This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to Livermore and the Bankhead Theatre and thank you for coming to the first of four Science on Saturday presentations for 2014. This is the 20th year that Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has produced these science presentations that are cutting edge with the help of top-notch scientists and local science educators. Before we go on, can I see a show of hands who's from Livermore? Who's from Tracy? Pleasanton? San Ramon? Great, glad to have you here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Mountain House. Sonol? Two? Oh, pressed. Our topic today is computer simulation, exploring nature and the, with the computer. Today, Dr. Castillo and science teacher Roger Johnson will address the specialized computer simulations that reproduce the behavior of nature, natural, and man-made systems to help us understand, predict, and communicate. Roger Johnson studied physical science at Cal State Hayward, or known as East Bay now, and is currently the science chair at Monta Vista High School where he teaches physics and chemistry. Roger participated in the Department of Energy's Academies Creating Teacher Scientists at the Lab, a three-year program that helps teachers progress as leaders in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. Dr. Castillo is a scientist and group leader in the Computational Engineering Division at Lawrence Livermore Lab. His background is computational physics, but is working on a wide range of complex problems from enterprise dynamics and workforce talent management to turbulent convective flows, hypersonic fluids, and chaos theory. Dr. Castillo is involved in many STEM-related activities, including the first LEGO League, first robotics competition, and the lab's new Teacher Research Academy for computer modeling and simulations. <clears throat> Recently, Dr. Castillo was honored with the 2013 Community Service Award from Great Minds in STEM, demonstrating leadership within the underserved, underrepresented STEM community through volunteer work, contributions, and, <clears throat> and other activities. Please ro welcome Roger and Vic. Thank you. Hey, me too. Welcome. Hey. Thanks all for coming out today. Good morning, Vic. Good morning, Roger. How are you doing here? Very good. Good. Very good. Well, uh, Vic, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Well, you know, I actually I started doing computer simulation a long time ago, back in high school, and uh, we were fortunate uh, to have computers back then uh, in our in our school, actually, you know, PCs, and and uh, I was so interested in science and and these computers. They were new tools to me, and I got to go on and and start playing with them and and start using them to solve problems and actually do some of my uh, homework assignments with them and it was just the coolest things and ever since then I've always used a computer to help solve problems and now at the lab we have the, the, the most powerful computers in the world and we're going to tell you a little bit about that too. Mm -hmm. Roger, why don't you tell us about what you're sure. doing? Yeah, so um, I, like you, I started out using computers in high school, and I was programming then, and uh, have continued on with that. Uh, right now, I use computer modeling in my classroom, and also, uh, along with Vic, we work with a summer program to train teachers about using computer models in their classroom. Sure. And Vic, at one point you said that you got started uh, in part, not just because of computers at school, because of science fiction and maybe some science movies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. It it was scenes like this, you know. And oh, you like guys, Star Trek. You guys recognize Star Trek? They're always yeah. using uh, the computer to solve some problem, right? They're going to some, uh, either saving the world or going to some foreign uh, or alien planet and trying to save that planet by the end of the episode. And often they use the computer 
to solve that problem. They're, they're out there and they're, 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 they have this great tool, this great powerful computer that they can talk to and it talks back and gives them the solution. And that's always been kind of a, a motivation for me. It kind of, um, I always found it as a very inspirational and uh, uh, part of uh, uh, influencing my, my career. Wow, great. Okay. okay. So why don't we let you guys know a little bit about what we're going to cover today. So we're going to let you know what the purpose uh, or, or how modeling and simulation is used, what it is, um, how it's used in the sciences, and then what they do with modeling and simulation at Livermore Lab. And finally, how you guys can get started doing modeling simulation either in your classroom for school projects or at home. So you can think about models uh, look at the world and they take uh, actors, things that move in the world, they have the environment of the world, and then the interactions of those actors in the environment. And runs of these models are simulations. So we can take, uh, for example, ants that go out and look for food. And maybe you have a problem at home with ants getting into your kitchen, you want to study it. You could look at that with a computer model or a computer simulation. The ant would be the actor, the kitchen would be the environment, and the interaction between the ants and your sugar bowl would be something you want to model so you can figure out how to keep them out of the food. So why don't we look at a model that yep. does this? Here, let me get it real quick. Okay. So what you're seeing on the screen right now um, is a still shot from a, a model that shows uh, ant behavior. And we have three piles of food, and these are the blue circles. Uh, and then the center purple circle is actually where the ants are, are starting, and that red dot indicates, or the red center is, is the, uh, where the ants are going to emerge. It's their colony, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And if I was maybe an entomologist and interested in studying ant behavior, or maybe I'm someone who's got an ant problem, they've invaded my house, I might want to know how to deal with this chemical trail. So we're going to see this model run here, and if we let it go, we see ants going out and foraging and leaving that chemical trail and then bringing the food back. So the blue dots represent the food, right? Yeah, the blue represents the food and that kind of white and green glow represents their chemical trail that they've left behind. Now, we can control this and we can change some of the parameters. So I could say, mm, I want this chemical trail to really hang around and I'm gonna change some settings and I'll let it run again. And this is a very long lasting chemical trail, so the ants will gather their food very rapidly. They'll function as a good solid team. But And I all can, the food is consumed roughly at the same time. Yeah, very yeah. quickly and, and yeah. roughly at the same time. On the other hand, what if I was a scientist who wanted to see, well, what's gonna happen if that chemical trail goes away really rapidly, if it evaporates rapidly, and I can try that, and notice that we don't really see that trail anymore. And the ants are no longer to function really as a team. It's very much a kind of an individual, oh, I happen to find food sort of thing. And so the results are dramatically different. So maybe if I was a person who wanted to control ants in my kitchen, I might want to do something that disrupts that chemical trail and I could study the possibilities there. So using a computer model or simulation allows us to consider ways to uh, solve major problems that we have or maybe just simple household problems as well. Here we see another example of uh, a natural system. What you have is uh, something like a snowflake, for example, that can grow out in the world there. And the red, uh, the red area is the material that can add on to it and the green is the already formed snowflake. Um, it could also be coral growing or other things. So over time, it gradually adds little bits of material. We'll see it, maybe, there we go, get larger. And this is a, a pretty random process. And if I was to try to do this with math, it would be a very challenging calculation for me to figure out. But a model can follow a few very simple rules and can create the pattern. So if I'm interested in studying something like this, if I'm going to try to do it mathematically, I'm stuck. But if I do it with a computer simulation, I've got a, a very powerful tool in my hands. And it creates a very good visual representation of it. So we see it grows and grows. Each time we run this model, though, we'll get a different pattern. 
It's kind of like it, snowflakes. Yeah, like the nature. snowflakes, exactly. Yeah. Or like coral or any of the other things, natural systems that work this way. Right. So it's a really um, nice this, visual, a nice way to understand that right. system. So besides coral, what else? What, uh, so we, talk, we could talk, like we said, snowflakes, lightning bolts, okay. uh, I don't know, other yeah. systems? Different. That sounds like a, this, 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 this type of uh, growth is seen in a lot of things in nature. Crystals, uh, when, we, when we make alloy metals, different, different things, both man-made and natural, have patterns like this. And so it's, it's a very uh, simple thing to model, but very difficult thing to do with a pen and paper to actually model this. Okay. So this brings us to how simulation fits into, uh, into science. There are three traditional legs in science. Uh, the, the older two, the first one is the experimentation and observation. This is kind of one way that we started off learning about the world around us. And then we developed theories and natural laws, laws of nature, and this was kind of the theoretical aspect of, 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 uh, of science. More recently, with the, the uh, computational tool, with the tool, the computer as a tool, we now have a third leg, computational science, which combines uh, the, the data from the experimental and the, uh, the uh, laws of physics from the, uh, from the theoretical size, side. So I'm gonna have, I, I, I drew, now don't make fun of my, my art because I'm, I'm a scientist, not an artist. But uh, we want to talk about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the original scientist here. You know, he, he, had, he, he needed to understand the world. He, he was just as curious as we were, and he had the power of, power of observation. He had his eyes, his ears, his nose, he could smell. He, he wanted to understand nature. And so he might question why water, how water runs down a river, or how a tree grows, or how the birds fly around. And so he will look around, he'll make his observation, they might write it down. And later, the scientists started using mathematical models. This was a very compact way of expressing what, how they view nature. It was uh, uh, very compact, and they can also pass that on to other scientists to, to help them with their work. And eventually, scientists got to use different tools, like the microscope and the telescope, which increased their observation skills, their power of observation, uh, far beyond what they, they could see with their eyes, for instance. And this gave them more accurate information and a lot more information. And as a result, they developed more laws of nature, a little more complicated laws of nature, a um, little more accurate laws of nature. Eventually, the scientists had access to great tools, such as the X-ray machine, and they could they could see well beyond what the eye could see, far greater detail um, inside of things. And you can see that the, the machine puts out binary information. That's the ones and the zeros that is coming out of the machine. Machines generate lots and lots of data. And, uh, and as a result, we can also come up with a lot more uh, laws of physics because we start, start to understand nature a little bit better. So more laws were developed. And, but the problem is, eventually, you have so much data to track. And we know this because we, we have the internet now. There's tons and tons of data. There's a lot of laws of physics that we might want to combine to, uh, to uh, actually make a more uh, complete view of the world. And what, this what the computer does, it helps us track all the data and combine the laws of physics to have a more realistic view of the world. And as a result of this, we usually express these in computer simulations, and a lot of times the graphic uh, expression of those. So to, to summarize what we're saying here then, computer modeling and simulations let you deal with a tremendous amount of data. They let you work with lots of rules or natural laws or equations all at once. And, and these two features combined with something that's been happening in computing over the last well, since its origin, and this development of faster and cheaper computing. So if you think about your cell phone, and Vic, you got a, a smartphone with yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you think about your smartphone here. So Everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, most of you guys know this, but if you go back to the original cell phones, like the one we see up behind me here, this was the 1970s, 80s model, thousands of dollars, and it did one thing. It could make a phone call. 
Okay, much more expensive, much fewer functions, much less computational power. You carry around a tremendously powerful little computer in your pocket now, and that one costs a few hundred dollars, and it can do phone calls, it can take pictures, it can take videos, you can go online, you can play games, you can listen to your music, all for much less money than the original phone. These same sorts of trends are occurring with computers, and they're occurring in your home computers, and they're occurring in the computers that Livermore Lab uses as well. Yeah, this, this, uh, this computer I hold in my hand is about, a, these things are approaching about a gigaflop of po processing power. Uh, this, is, this is a tremendous computer, but the, the supercomputer that we use at the lab, the, uh, the Sequoia machine, has, runs at around 16 petaflops. That's about 16 million times this processing speed. And so this helps us uh, process and run a lot of different simulations and helps us understand very interesting aspects of nature. And so I'm gonna go through, a, a uh, show a little video that will uh, show the diversity of the things that we explore uh, in, in, in the work we do at the lab. Material science. Air drag. Turbulence. Plasma. Neutrons. Earthquake dynamics. And shear flow, or a wind shear. In fact, another thing that we're starting to work on is additive manufacturing, or something sometimes called 3D printing. So are you guys familiar with 3D printing? Do you guys know? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so you probably have a 3D printer somewhere in your school or something, right? Well, we're doing 3D printing with metal. And so in order to do this, it, is, it, it gets a lot more complicated. And what we have here is a, a simulation that shows a, a bed of very fine metal particles. So this is a very small scale. And those particles are blue because they're cold right now. So they're just sitting there. And then what we do is we want to melt those with a, with a laser. And so as soon as we apply the laser, the, you see the metal heating up melting, liquefying, uh, cooling off, and solidifying. So that is like one dot, like one pixel for a 3D metal object that we might print. And something that we printed recently was, was an example of that is this rocket motor. And this rocket motor ha is made out of stainless steel. It has hollow skin for the fluid to go through to cool it off. And it, this is a very complicated thing to design and build. Uh, to understand how, how much laser power to put in, uh, what powder size to, to use at different parts. So it's a very difficult thing. And having the supercomputer to help solve that problem is the best way to, to, to make this a, uh, a part that really can work. So we're gonna talk now a little bit about how you can get involved in doing computer modeling and simulation. And we're gonna tell you about some software called NetLogo. It's freeware, you could go download it this afternoon if you want. Um, and it comes out of Northwestern University. It's a, an agent-based modeling software. And you really don't need to know what that means, but give it a try. So we're gonna tell you, first of all, why you wanna to, to, to look at this. It's easy to use, you can run it on pretty much any computer you have at home, Mac, PC, if you have a Linux machine, it's fine. Um, it's a quick learn one. The language is very natural in its flow, so it's not difficult. And uh, it has a lot of free or sample models that come with it, so you have a good base to begin with as well. So why don't we step over and okay. take a look. Now, we have a, 
uh, we had a student who was interested in looking at uh, architecture and wanted to do a design problem for a science fair where they were looking at building energy usage. And so the traditional architectural drawing with a little bit of energy flow added in can give you some information, but it really leaves a lot to, the, to, to be figured out. And so the student would then go ahead and do a, a, an actual architectural design, maybe in SketchUp, and then from there go and build a physical model. And in this case, the student tested the physical model uh, with heat lamps and different types of roofs to see how changing the roof color could affect the uh, energy usage of the building. But she took it one step further because she realized if she really wanted to study this system, it would be great to be able to, to vary the roofs in fine detail and get lots of data on it. And so she built a computer model of it. And we can see that the roof here has, uh, or this building has a little window up near the top there, that straight section. And in this model, when we start it, there's going to be sunlight coming in. It's going to strike the roof. It's going to heat up the air in the building. And then that heated air will rise out through the top window. So we can see the light coming in, striking the roof. The red dots represented the heated molecules of air inside the uh, building. And some of them are escaping out the open window. So the heated air rises just like hot air naturally does, right? Yeah. We still see the temperature going up, however. Now, if I close the window, it's going to get even worse. The temperature rise continues, increases a little bit, in fact. Now, this model also allowed the student to control the color of the roof. So we can take this to real extremes and put a very dark roof on here. And very little of the energy is being reflected back now. You, can, you don't see much in the way of sunlight bouncing off it, if you will. And you see a lot of red dots moving inside there, and the temperature is stabilizing okay. so this, <laughs> at this, the new hot temperature. This is like the uh, roof that we see driving around, right? Very yeah. dark. Yeah, there yeah. we go. And now it begins to climb again. So we can go to the other extreme then. And we'll lighten the roof. And you, can, you notice as you slide along here that you have a total control over the variation of roof colors. So the student is able to study a tremendous variety of possible scenarios. And already we see temperature dropping. And if we open the window, we see a further rapid drop in temperature. So this became a very powerful tool for her, and it was a, an important part of her presentation when she got to do a, a poster presentation with it. So you might want to be thinking about how you could employ something like this in uh, a science project or a science fair that you're involved in. So we can also use the uh, simulation to model other things. Um, here's something that we use quite a bit in, in schools. It's, uh, it's a turtle bot, and a turtle bot uh, is, is kind of a homemade device. It's, it's made out of a, a Roomba. Uh, how many people here know what a Roomba is? A few of you, okay. About half. It's, it's actually a, it's a robotic vacuum cleaner, and you've probably seen it on YouTube quite a bit with a cat on top. But uh, we, we hack into that, and uh, oh, we have a special guest right here. Uh, this is this is our Got this it. is a this is a turtle bot, and uh, we hack into it so that we can actually control it. And so we put a Microsoft Connect on there so it has eyes, and um, and uh, and a and a, and a uh, little laptop so that we can program it. And we can, uh, we can, it can actually identify a pair of legs and follow, follow the legs around. And it's really great in a crowd because it just goes around randomly following people. And, uh, but so this is an important thing in, in, with STEM education, but we want to understand a little bit more about how the robot works. So what we want to do, or what we have done, is build some computer simulations to help students understand robotics and actually um, help students actually program this particular robot in uh, example. Side. So can we go to the? Yeah, can you go to the next one? There we go. Yeah. OK, uh, so what you see now is a simulation that was developed by students off, to uh, help them when they were programming the Roomba that you just saw, or the, uh, um, the turtle bot that you just saw. So um, 
This particular uh, simulation, uh, on the one up on the big screen here, you can see the green turtle represents the turtle bot, and there's a red target that it's looking for. Now, uh, the cone in front of it, the slightly lighter cone, is the cone of vision provided by the Kinect. And it's going to interact with its environment and provide information to the computer, which then directs the Roomba and it moves across the room. So the students that were dealing with this used the simulation first, then wrote their code for the turtle bot that they then used in a robotics competition. So we've got one, their software up and we'll let it run. And you can see the turtle bot looking around and it finds a barrier and it works its way around the barrier. It's a little slow at first. And it sees that there's something there. And it knows where the target is. So it's yeah, always yeah. trying to return to uh, find the target. And there it goes, it makes it back. So it becomes a very powerful tool for not just then a science fair or science project, but also an engineering or a robotics project. Okay. And this could have very practical applications. One of the students um, wants to have this and, and have it for her grandmother. And so it would go on and, and just uh, look around, find grandma, say hi, maybe send a, a message to her from, her from her granddaughter, and then go back and, and hang out somewhere else for a while. So there's a lot of fun things that we could do, and some things are very practical that we can do with robotics. <laughs> robotics are a very important part of our future. You know, and understanding robotics, along with computer simulation, is very important, too. Okay, so I think we have a student example now. <clears throat> yes. You want to advance that one? Okay. Yeah, I did. This is on, on you. Oh. So let's introduce uh, Luke. Okay, so um, it, this is Luke Alessari. He's a student at San Ramon Valley High School. And Luke, what year are you now? I'm in ninth grade. Ninth grade, and you're taking what science class? Accelerated uh, bio. Bio, okay, yeah. so you're in a biology class, and you started modeling, well, how long ago did you start modeling? In September, so at the beginning of the school year, I joined a club at San Ramon, and I got into it. Okay, so why don't you tell us about the model that you've got uh, on the computer here. Okay, so this model mm -hmm. demonstrates the light-dependent reaction uh, in photosynthesis. And this is something I learned in biology, and it was just a diagram in my textbook. And with NetLogo, I was able to bring it to life in a fun and not so complicated way. So as we start this up, you'll notice that there are purple arrows that simulates the sunlight, and they're going to be absorbed by the pigments in the chloroplast called chlorophyll. And the energy is transferred using the orange lightning bolts to the central chlorophyll. And the central chlorophyll, you'll see in a minute, will shoot off an electron. And this electron will go on a roller coaster ride, and along the way, it'll release energy to pump a hydrogen ion, which are the gray orbs, um, into the thylakoid jail. So. You'll see that in a second. Looks like it's about to happen. <laughs> All right, so there's one. And it actually, so basically this model is alive and it brings something that was dead in a textbook to life. And then in the next stage, it'll shoot off another electron and that will get stored in a molecule that the cell can actually use. So you can see one right there and it'll get stored for the cell to use. And then later in the process, the hydrogen in the jail will always want to get out. So in order to do that, on the right most of the model, there is a component that the hydrogen will do work for, and it'll transfer the energy to a mo mo another molecule that the cell can use called ATP. So um, there, as you notice, on the, to the right of the model, there are three graphs. And they basically show, the top one shows how many moving parts are in the model at once. The middle one will show the hydrogen spread out, so how much is in the floating around in the space and how much is in the jail. 
and then at the bottom graph shows how much energy the model has produced. Fantastic. And, and Luke, how long had you been uh, in the club or modeling before you built your first model on your own? Uh, probably a week. A week. Afterwards. Yeah. So, so, so it's really easy if you want to get started on this. Um, and obviously, he's taken it to some really great level here. But uh, it's not it's not overwhelming. Any one of you could pick this up and begin. And then, if you stick with it, like Luke has, you could have some fantastic things to add to what you do in the classroom or what you do at home. Thanks so much for coming Thanks in for today. Yeah, me. great. Thank you. So now we're, we're going to summarize what we've uh, talked about, what, what you've learned um, about modeling and simulation, how it's used to create artificial environments so that we can, we can explore, experiment, and explain the world around us. Uh, we learned that computers are really good for crunching a lot of data and for managing or tracking a lot of rules or uh, laws of nature. And they're also they're becoming faster and cheaper. And actually, there's a, there's a, uh, a theory uh, it's called uh, Moore's yes. Law. And this is, this is got a, a gentleman, a scientist, a computer scientist back in the 50s. He predicted that computers will get faster and cheaper exponentially. And that uh, because the transistors are getting smaller and smaller. And as a result, we, we're, you know, we're seeing that exact, that, that, that exact trend. Uh, we haven't seen an end to that yet, and we anticipate that computers are going to constantly get faster and cheaper. And that's one of the important points here, is that this, the computer is very important today, but it's going to be even more important in the future. And so knowing about how to use the computer to solve problems will be a very important part of, of your career. And you don't, not, you don't have to be a scientist to use a, a computer for our computer simulation. Economists, bio, you know, all, um, uh, so, uh, so social scientists, well, different types of scientists, uh, data folks, uh, a lot of different careers. Uh, management are starting to use uh, computer simulation to do their jobs. We also see that the Lawrence Livermore Lab computer, uh, uh, scientists use the most powerful computer in the world to solve their problems. And that you can start with a simple tool called NetLogo and also with using your imagination. And I think uh, reemphasizing what, uh, what Luke, Luke is saying, uh, simulations can be easy and fun. So this is a, uh, the kickoff of a themed Science on Saturday. We're doing uh, simulation as a, as a tool for scientific discovery. Uh, in the, the next couple of talks, the next three talks, we're going to talk about um, uh, high energy density physics, how stars form their, uh, uh, how stars work, how the sun works, and how we can do uh, fusion here on Earth uh, in, in the laboratory. We're going to study about protein models, how viruses work, how viruses might mutate to be, uh, change their proteins to become superbugs, and also how the human heart works. How the, uh, and what's important about doing this in computer simulation is that we don't want to do simulation or experimentation on real living human hearts or superbugs or things that go are, are very powerful. So it, it, it's much better to start doing computer simulation to understand this first and then uh, uh, ex, uh, do, the, uh, experiment, well, do the experimentation in the computer. Thank you very much for coming out Thanks. today. We really appreciate it. And we hope that you get started in modeling. Yeah.